please welcome Dr. Laura Michaels. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me here. It's, uh, it's great to um, have a chance to talk to folks. And also, it's very good for me to have a chance to listen to some of my peers talk a little bit about how they manage things. I learn e things every time. So um, I'm not gonna, gonna, I'm gonna back up a little bit. We just heard an incredibly important overview about the treatments available for MPNs. But Anne had asked me to really focus a little bit more on the very basics. What is this disease? How does it happen? Why did this happen to me? Um, these are very basic, so it might be a little remedial for some of you. Please ask me questions, but my goal is to talk a little bit about the biology, what's happening in the bone marrow, and to try and do it in a way that explains the clinical impacts on patients. So we're going to talk today about what is happening that occurs that causes a myeloproliferative neoplasm, whether or not that's polycythemia vera, myelofibrosis, or essential thrombocythemia. We're going to then look at some pictures that I was very grateful to get from a colleague in Australia, some pictures of what the bone marrow looks like. Many of you guys have been through a bone marrow biopsy. We're going to see how we diagnose these diseases from the bone marrow. What are the common symptoms that people have? You're going to get in a more expanded talk on what this means, um, symptom management, and what the symptoms people have later on in the afternoon. I'm just going to briefly touch on it. And then I am not going to go into the treatments to nearly the level of uh, graceful detail that my predecessor did, but I just want to do an overview about how you decide on treatments. So myeloproliferative neoplasms are diseases of the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is located, as you know, um, and again, forgive me if this is review for everybody, but the bone marrow is in adults is in the pelvis in the long bones of the legs, a little bit in the skull and the sternum. And it also exists in the other long bones, but that's where that's why we do the bone marrow biopsy in the pelvis, because that's where most of the bone is, her bone marrow is. And when you're a fetus and you don't have bones, your bone marrow is made in the spleen. So for example, when your bone marrow gets filled with scar tissue, the body's trying to figure out someplace else to make blood. Where does it go? It puts it in the spleen, for example, which is located right here. But all blood cancers are diseases of the bone marrow cells. And this is a, this bone marrow cells are called stem cells. I usually, when I am talking to my interns or my medical students, when I'm going over things with patients, I use the analogy that the bone marrow is a garden, and the garden is filled with seeds, and these seeds are stem cells. But if you could plant a, a garden with one kind of seed, and yet know that you could grow cabbages or basil or rutabaga or roses from that same seed, then you get, get an idea of how flexible that seed needs to be. It needs to grow into any of the many blood cells that you need, your white blood cells, your platelets, and your red blood cells. And for a given seed to be able to turn into a rutabaga or a tulip or basil, it would need to have very complex instructions inside of it. And those instructions need to be flexible and dynamic. They need to be able to be responsive to the environment and the events that are happening in the garden. If it's cloudy or sunny or rainy, it needs to be very complex. And that's why you get a very complex stem cell, a lot of DNA inside. These stem cells are with you when you're born and you die with them. They, their only job is to make blood cells and to make more stem cells. And so this stem cell that's very delicate, now this can isn't what you hear about in the news, it's not to become an, a hair cell, a skin cell, a heart cell, it only becomes your blood cell, but it's a very complex and delicate cell. So normally, that stem cell is in charge of growing into your blood. It grows into your lymph cells. Your lymph cells are a key part of your, um, a key part of your immune system, and then it grows into your myeloid cells, you're going to hear those words, things like lymph and myeloid. But this stem cell differentiates into what becomes your red cells, your platelets, your infection-fighting neutrophils and monocytes. And for this stem cell to work, and for your bone marrow and your blood organ, the blood, 
to continue to be healthy, that stem cell needs to be able to mature, which is what we need, what we say when we mean the word differentiate, means it needs to grow up into any of its possible, um, any of its possible endpoints. It needs to be able to make more stem cells, and it needs to be able to die off appropriately. So when a, a cell makes a mistake and turns into a mutant cell of some kind, it should turn off. It should basically commit suicide. But if there's a mistake of some kind that prevents it from committing suicide, then you can have these mutant cells persist. So a normal bone marrow gets signals from the body, and here are your stem cells, and it grows into red blood cells. Those are the that's what carries oxygen, and the absence of that makes anemia. It grows into platelets. The, that's what keeps your blood clotting at the right, the right way, so it's, your blood doesn't turn into mayonnaise or water that you're able to uh, clot. And it's what allows your body to fight infections with this group of white blood cells. So for example, when you're pregnant and you become anemic for some reason, a hormone goes into your body, hormone is created by the kidneys, goes into the bone marrow, and says, hey, uh, we're anemic, make some more red blood cells. So these stem cells hear that and say, hey, I'm supposed to change my proportion of red blood cells to other cells and make more of these, and it does so. When you're fighting mononucleosis, your body makes a hormone, that hormone goes into the bone marrow and says, hey, I'm an in, there's an infection here. I need, uh, I need to fight this infection. So the stem cells create an extra dose of white blood cells, new immune cells to go out and fight that infection. Same things with platelets. If you're bleeding for some reason, you're, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a meteor fell on you and you're bleeding. <laughs> um, you're, the uh, platelets um, are increased because of hormone set. So these stem cells, these stem cells don't know what's going on in the body. They don't know if you've been in a motorcycle accident. They don't know if you're fighting mononucleosis unless they are told to do so, to change by the hormone signals that come from the outside. But they're very responsive to those. Otherwise, they just kind of do their normal process and keep you in balance. So they read these signals by receptors these, this is, again, this is my like computer generated picture, so it's not that artistic, but these signals here, these are called receptors, and these are the hormones. So normally the hormones tell the stem cell what to do, or the blood cell what to do, and sometimes mistakes happen. Those mistakes, those genetic accidents happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes those ha accidents happen, and the most common accident is just age. Uh, every time these stem cells reproduce, there's a chance that a mistake happens. The older you get, the more likelihood there is a mistake that happens, and that mistake gets into the DNA of the cell. And that mistake then is carried on every time that DNA, every time that cell replicates. So in a normal process, if everything's, that cell would get would commit suicide, like I said, it would turn off. It would say, hey, there's a mistake here, I shouldn't replicate. But if that mistake happens in the part of the DNA that's supposed to turn the cell off, then it carries on. Sometimes that mistake happens in the part of the cell that allows that cell to differentiate. So it says immature, and you have a over collection of immature stem cells. And sometimes that mistake happens in the part of the DNA that's supposed to make this receptor, for example. Let's say this receptor is called the JAK2 receptor. And if the mistake happens here, and all of a sudden this cell thinks it's hearing this hormone when it's not. And that's called the JAK2 mutation, for example. And that's often the very first mistake that happens. And all of a sudden you have stem cells that they think they're hearing this hormone, they think that it's like they're hearing an echo, or uh, that it's that they're they're hearing it come back and forth and back and forth. This echo instead of what really happens. So before you had a normal bone marrow listening to hear the hormone and say, "Oh, it's time I make some red cells," or "Oh, it's time I make some platelets," 
And now you have a mistake in this receptor, and it's making red cells and making platelets even when that hormone isn't there, even when there's no signal from the body at all. And what have you got now? You've got a bone marrow or a stem cell, a group of these stem cells, I would say, that's turned on, that's just going to act on its own, that doesn't care if there's no signal from the body, doesn't care if there's an event that says it should make it. It's a very, it's an overproductive bone marrow. And that's often the first step in what's happening in the bone marrow in myeloproliferative neoplasms. So now you have a group of stem cells that have that mutation. And every time they reproduce, that mutation is in there. And so you have some good stem cells in that bone marrow, but you also have some mutant ones. And that means you have an increase of blood cell production from that particular group of stem cells. And it turns out what, that the cells that they make may not work the same as the other ones. They might be stickier. They might be less likely to flow through the blood vessels of the heart or the, or the brain, meaning you are at increased risk for things like strokes or heart attacks. They might cluster and cause white cells to group around them, which can cause things like pulmonary embolism or blood clots in the legs, which we call venous thromboses. And it also means that they might reproduce a little bit more quickly than other cells. So they might have a growth advantage over the good cells, right? They might, and every time they reproduce, every time that stem cell makes another one that has those mistakes, there's a chance for more mistakes to happen. So you might have had one one that just had that JAK2 mutation, but then over time that one reproduces enough that there's another mistake. And now you have a, another error, right, that might decrease the frequency of um, mat maturation or increase the frequency of duplication. And pretty soon you have some stem cells that don't look even like that first mutant. Now you have a bunch of a relatively chaotic bone marrow. Some of these might also overproduce, not just overproduce platelets or overproduce red cells, some of these mutant cells might overproduce chemicals, chemicals that you'd have if you had the flu or you had mono, things like night sweats. They might overproduce the things that give you fevers. They might make you feel that you just can't control your temperature well. It might f make you feel more tired. They might increase the risk for fibrosis or scarring in your bone marrow. And those are the kind of symptoms that go along with a more chaotic bone marrow, a bone marrow that's overproducing chemicals that not just cells. So what you end up having is a bone marrow that's producing a lot of these chemicals that has not just one mutant zombie stem cell, but several different kinds with different colors, right? And a lot of scar tissue. The scar tissue means that bone marrow is having trouble. The good seeds that are in there can't really get through. So the body says, hey, I got to find somewhere else to find bone marrow, to make bone. So, so what does it do? It goes to where it did it when you were a fetus, before you even had bones, and it makes blood cells in the spleen. So this whole picture is no longer a garden that's growing nice, neat rows of cabbage and tulips and basil. Now you have a garden that's got weeds in it. And those weeds are poisoning the soil, and they're just making it difficult for the good cells to grow. Now, not most people with myeloproliferative neoplasms are in a situation, if they have polycythemia vera or ET, where you're not looking at a full-on weed-filled garden. You're looking at the overproduction of a single kind of cell, a red cell or a, a a red cell or a platelet. But sometimes when the disease gets advanced, you get something that looks a little bit more like myelofibrosis. And sometimes this is what develops in the very beginning. And that looks a little bit more like a weedy garden. So that leads to what patients experience, this overproduction of cells, a tendency for blood clots or bleeding. And those blood clots can be in the veins or in the arteries. When we talk about vein clots, we're talking about clots in the legs or the lungs predominantly, but sometimes it's also clots in the liver or in the, the uh, spleen area. And sometimes those blood clots can be, for example, in the placenta, 
And that's why people with these diseases tend to have more difficulty having children carried to term. There's a tendency for bleeding, and that's because those cells that are made don't interact as well with the blood vessels, or sometimes that overproduction of platelets, platelets which are supposed to keep you from bleeding, sometimes that overproduction of platelets can make the kind of the choreography of the blood off, right? And that means that it's harder to, for the normal processes that prevent bleeding to occur. There's an increase in fibrosis of the bone marrow, and that fibrosis goes along with the types of symptoms we talked about. And we have stem cells that are additional, that are vulnerable to additional mutations, basically that they are genetically unstable. And that can lead to things like transformation from PV to myelofibrosis, or from ET to myelofibrosis, or even, in rare cases, to diseases that look like leukemia, acute leukemia. So now we're going to go in some pictures. Here's a picture of an enlarged spleen. This is the type of thing we can see on a CT scan, but this is also what we can measure in the clinic. We were talking about how you measure it, which means you find the left part of the uh, rib cage and then you press on it. And patients with large spleens can have increase or decrease in their appetite and early feelings of what they call early satiety, which is a fancy pants way of saying, I get full soon. People can have blood clots or bleeding like we talked about, and people can have scar tissue in their bone marrow. So how do we know if somebody has this? It's all well and good to look at a bunch of cartoons and think, oh, scientifically, how can this happen? But we do know that people get this, and we know it because of a full people present, and there are some things that we can look at. To diagnose this condition, the doctor needs to do a full history and a complete physical exam. I, when I went to medical school, my mentor said, if you're ever in question about anything, just ask the patient. And this should all start with a history, not only of you, but of your family as well. And it shouldn't just start with what you feel like in the last three months. You need to go back in time. For example, people with essential thrombocythemia might come in as asymptomatic, meaning they were just found routinely to have high platelet counts. But more than 50% can relate symptoms that have been going on for more than a year at the time that they were diagnosed. And so really sometimes a look back People have been blaming symptoms on my age, or, oh, I thought I was going through menopause, or, no, I was on a new medicine, or my doctor said it was just migraines. And really, if you take a look back, people's symptoms have been going on much longer than sometimes you know. So a complete history should also include people's history of medication usage, their family history, any fertility issues that they've had, and then, of course, a complete physical exam where you pay a lot of attention to, for example, um, the, the spleen and the abdomen size, any problems that people might have with blood vessels like Renaud's or headaches, a neurological exam, et cetera. We then examine the peripheral blood smear. And when I say that, peripheral blood smear means when you draw blood from a vein in the arm and they sm you smear it on a little glass slide, that gives us an idea of what blood cells look like and how they might be different from what we call normal. And normal just means blood cells that are being made in a marrow that doesn't have fibrosis or that doesn't have some of these mutations. Everybody should get a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate in a biopsy. The new World Health Organization criteria indicate this. Not everybody's had one. It's not always an emergency to get it but it can give very good information. And in particular, when you're deciding what is the real diagnosis, whether or not this is essential thrombocythemia or myelofibrosis, this is something that we now recommend. And finally, a, a few key laboratory tests, which we'll talk about in a second. So what is a bone marrow? Why do we do it? A bone marrow biopsy is our way to look at the garden. It's to take a small sample and to understand is the garden looking normal, or is there evidence of an increasing scar tissue or a chaotic bone marrow? Now, when, when people have had, a, for a bone marrow biopsy, we approach this through a, a um, incision and then biopsy at the 
posterior iliac crest, and the piece of bone that's gotten in this hollow needle is about two centimeters long. And in a normal bone marrow, you're gonna see bits of bone here. This is called trabecular bone. This is the actual bone, and then in between that is the marrow. And just like when you have a roast beef at Christmas and you have that hollow bone area, this, is, this goes in there, and you can sometimes see that webbing of bone, and that's what this is. You also know that there's white spaces, which is fat, and that's kind of the nutrients or the sort of substrate that the marrow lives in. But a healthy bone marrow has a good proportion of fat. Bone marrow cells, bone marrow forming cells, and there needs to be a balance there, and then spongy bone as well. In the normal bone marrow, you can see here, has all of the seeds growing into normal cells. So you can see the early cabbage, the early tulip, the early rutabaga, right? And these early cells can be differentiated. And the best thing about a normal bone marrow is it's varied, okay? There's evidence that the, that the bone marrow is growing into everything that you're gonna need when you grow up. You're gonna need, have these things called megakaryocytes, which are gonna give birth to platelets. And you're gonna have these things called uh, these guys in here, which are gonna turn into red cells, and some of these guys like uh, here, which are gonna turn into white blood cells, and some of your infection-fighting cells. I'm a little embarrassed because Dr. Chameau is a pathologist, and I am not, and she's, <laughs> she's incredible at this. So a normal bone marrow is varied, okay? A normal bone marrow looks heterogeneous, meaning there's lots of nice young stuff growing up there. It's not filled with one thing. A normal bone marrow has a, has a balance between fat and cells. A normal bone marrow has occasional megakaryocytes, which are, this looks gigantic, and it is compared to some of the other cells, but it has a nice grouping of its, of its uh, lobes here. These guys are getting ready to give birth to platelets. And a normal bone marrow does not have scar tissue in it or fibrosis for the most part. Now, when you get polycythemia vera, which is where one of those stem cells has had this mutation, the JAK2 mutation, and now it's just making red cells because it doesn't know to stop. It's just hearing that echo of that hormone. Well, you can see that first off, there seems to be some, a lot of crowding here. It looks more crowded than before. And there's an overproduction of these guys, these young red blood cells. And that's because that Stem cell has just been, that switch has been flipped, and it's just going to make red cells whether or not you need it or not. Another thing that can happen is that there's, even though it's a red cell, overproducing red cells, you can still see occasional abnormal megakaryocytes, these guys. And you can also see that there's, doesn't this look a little more crowded to you, that the balance between the fat and the cells isn't the same, there's not the same nutrients in the soil? And certainly, it doesn't look as heterogeneous, right? You're not seeing the spread of the cells that you might have. How about when it turns into something worse? This is when we occasionally, not always, of course, but occasionally, polycythemia vera can turn into acute leukemia. These slides, by the way, are from Dr. Erba, who I or Erber, who I talked about from Australia. That's why polycythemia is spelled in this cool way. Um, as is leukemia. So um, leukemia is when that marrow starts producing too many immature white blood cells, and they produce these things called blasts. Blasts are immature, red, or immature white blood cells, early, early stem cells that have mutations in them. You can see them here. This, this guy here, for example, is a good example. These very large nucleus, which is the the DNA of the cell means it's abnormal and it has these holes in it called nucleoli. We sometimes see these produced in patients with myelofibrosis without leukemia, but sometimes you do, you do see it with leukemia. That difference just depends a lot on the proportion of the cells being made. And then in myelofibrosis, what we see is scarring. You can see these strips of tissue here, and that's more scar tissue in it. Here in essential thrombocythemia, the megakaryocytes are what become very large and abnormal. Too many folds, too many, and they tend to cluster in groups instead of being spread out in the marrow. There are too many of them, and again, they have these, these picture, the, the 
the lobes don't look normal, so they're not going to give birth to normal platelets. And again, the scarring. So in myelofibrosis, when there's bone marrow scarring, you tend to even see evidence of that in the peripheral blood, where the cells that you make look like they've been slid through a colander. Instead of coming out normal and round, like you might like here, a nice round red cell, if these cells are having to circulate through a scarred bone marrow or a very large spleen, you can see them look, we call these for uh, teardrop cells for obvious reasons. And these are evidence that the spleen is getting enlarged or that there's scar tissue. And you can also see here, this is what we call fibrosis of the marrow. So this is the, the, the scar tissue I talked about which is the result of those chemicals being released by the abnormal stem cells. So those findings are what we look at when we do a bone marrow biopsy, when we're sorting through whether or not a patient has essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, or myelofibrosis. And when we do that, when we come to the diagnosis, before your di doctor says, this is what you have, they need to have done those things including your history and physical, your blood counts, your erythropoietin levels, molecular testing, including something called JAK2, calreticulin, and my, um, MPL, a bone marrow biopsy with testing for certain cytogenetics, including excluding a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And just like the speaker before me said, this is a time when it's very important to get it right. It doesn't matter how long it takes, but you need to be patient and get it right. How sure are we of this diagnosis? Are you sure that this isn't something reactive? Some people have walked into my clinic with platelets of a million, and all they have is iron deficiency. Or they've just had a surgery. That's not ET. That's something reactive. They don't need to be worried about a cancer. Has the pathology been reviewed? So I would second the recommendation that your, the pathology of your bone marrow biopsy should get a second opinion. Usually these are rare situations. So make sure you ask, has my pathology been reviewed? All right, so I'm gonna go on and be, I'm not sure what my time is. Okay, I have about five minutes, so I'm gonna talk really fast. Okay, um, first off, you're gonna get a nice talk on this, some of the symptoms that come with PV and ET, like we talked about, risks for clotting, symptoms including itching, fatigue, uh, something called erythromyalgia, which is a sort of a skin and extremity pain that can be really significant. And then also, once you start treatment, you take on other side effects, and those are the treatment side effects. So everything is a balance. What's due to my disease? What's due to my treatment? How do I balance those things? Myelofibrosis also has similar things, treatment side effects, splenomegaly. The symptoms can be worse in myelofibrosis, and Robin's going to talk a lot about this later on in the afternoon, so I will kind of spin through this. this like we talked about, there's the day-to-day -day symptoms, things like night sweats, bleeding, pain. There's also medication-associated side effects, um, not only side effects, but anxiety about taking medications, some of the financial implications of medications. And then we also need to keep in mind that people have special circumstances that they have to go through, things like phlebotomy, surgery, how do we manage contraception in pregnancy. So I'm just gonna speed through this, but once you've been diagnosed, the next step is you need to talk to your doctor about how am I, what is my risk. Each of the diseases, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis have several ways to score risk, okay? That means you look at the patient, you look at the disease, you look at all the information, and you say, I think your disease is in a low risk category, an intermediate risk category, or a high risk category, for example. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the scoring systems, but I do think that you should talk to your doctor about which scoring system is being used and what your level is, okay? Sometimes that risk is tied to a vascular event or a history of heart disease, increasing age, for example, or the genetics of your disease. Is it JAK2 positive or CalR positive, et cetera? Depending on how the scoring system they're used and whether or not you have PV or ET, you can sort of sort out what category am I in. Now, scoring systems for risk also mean what am I at risk of? Are you talking at risk for getting a blood clot? or am I at risk for 
um, having my uh, life shortened because of this disease. So when you're talking about what my risk is, it's not just how high my risk is, but what is the, what, it, what are we talking risk of what? Myelofibrosis, the most common risk scoring systems are the DIPSS or the DIPSS plus. And this again, you take information about the patient, information about the disease, and you can sort of talk to people about that. Now again, I'm not going into details, but once you have that, then people can kind of calculate how long till I have an effect from this. For example, if I have intermediate risk ET by this particular score, then I can go, you know, half the people can go 20 years before they get this particular outcome, okay? So when you're talking to your doctor about your risk score, say, what is my likelihood of having a, some catastrophic event from my disease, and how can we modulate that risk? There's certain, there's those kind of calculators for polycythemia vera, for ET, and for myelofibrosis. So my take home about risk is ask your dis disease doctor to describe what risks you face. And based on those risks, what are the reasons that I should start treatment? Do I need to start treatment? And if so, wh what level of treatment do I need to start? What would happen if I didn't start treatment? What would be the risks that I would face? What symptoms or toxicity should I attribute to the treatment versus attributing them to the disease itself? And how will we know if this treatment is working? Okay, those are the types of questions that we should sit down and talk about with our patients on a regular basis. So I'm gonna speed through this. All, in general, and this goes back to what uh, my predecessor was talking about, there's general management of PV and ET and myelofibrosis. Most patients with PV need to be maintained on a hematocrit of less than 45% for men, and I tend to keep my women slightly lower at 43%. PV patients need to be on an aspirin, and they need to have aggressive reduction of their cardiovascular risk factors, like diabetes. No patient should smoke. Um, we need to make sure we prevent them from having heart attacks and strokes, which are the biggest danger to this disease. And people should start blood count lowering, called cytoreduction, if they have some additional other conditions, which, again, depends on the risk that you're facing. And medications like uh, we heard a little bit are include hydrea, interferon, jacophy, or ruxolitinib, or clinical trial. Essential thrombocythemia, again, most DT patients should be on aspirin, but there are some who can be managed without aspirin, um, very low risk patients, cytoreduction, and medications. Management of myelofibrosis, I generally make a kind of a grid for people and go over what our goals are and what are the appropriate interventions are when I'm talking about it. So I'm gonna speed through because I'm getting the hook here from Kathleen. We've talked a little bit about everything I want you guys to, this is a website you should know, the clinicaltrials.gov website. This will give you up-to-date information about clinical trials available. Ask, 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 ask. Please keep being aggressive in your curiosity. Uh, educate yourself and other patients. Continue to engage because that's how progress is made. Thank you very much.